Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Game Informer podcast. I'm your host this time around. My name is Ben Hansen, and I'm joined by Brian Horton, who's the game director for Rise of the Tomb Raider. How's it going? Hey, pretty good, man. Thanks for joining us. So on yes, this podcast, good. we're taking a bunch of questions from the community about the upcoming Tomb Raider game, and we're going to volley them towards you. So I hope you're ready. I'm ready. Okay, great. First question is from a user named William Croft, and he's wondering about the tease at the last game. His question is, what about Croatoan, which apparently is in the journal at the end of the first game, and a lot of fans thought that that was going to be the next location for the next Tomb Raider. Yeah, so the the journal played a significant role in us thinking about where uh, setting up some mysteries for the the franchise. Um, We weren't planning on expressing a specific uh, nod to the sequel with that, with that, but it was something that was important that we got people thinking about. There's going to be further stories and adventures for Lara Croft in the future, and this journal was going to be um, an important part of her discovery. Gotcha. And can you explain the gap between the reboot of Tomb Raider and then Rise of the Tomb Raider? And is it kind of implied that Lara has gone on adventures in between these two? Yeah, we have um, some. Uh, we have a, a novel. And we have comic books that sort of tell that continuing journey uh, of Lara and what happens to her after returning from Yamatai. And then she she does go on a series of adventures um, looking for secrets and, and uh, trying to understand and process what happened to her on Yamatai. And, and then we pick up um, directly after uh, that the supplemental material with Rise of the Tomb Raider. And how involved are you guys in writing that supplemental material? So for our continuing fiction in between the games we have uh, Rihanna Pratchett and she was the writer of the first game Tomb Raider um, with our internal team and she's working directly on the comic books uh, and then we also work very closely with the writers for the no- the novel and um, and other uh, writers that we had on the comics previous so the team is very much involved invested in making sure that the, the stories that they get in these extended stories map very well to our plans for uh, for the game, and they will feather directly into Rise of the Tomb Raider. Gotcha. And they kind of dive into the backstory of kind of the secret organization that Lara is going to be going up against in Rise of the Tomb Raider? Yeah, there, there's a series of, of clues that we continue to, um, to drop about uh, an organization out there um, that uh, is is interested in similar things to Lara, but we're not quite sure of their, uh, of, of their, what their goals are. Uh, and that plays very directly into the central narrative for Rise of the Tomb Raider. Gotcha. And what's the name of that organization again? So the organization is called Trinity, and we've, we name dropped that organization in um, uh, tomb, the Tomb Raider, the last game, and also throughout the comic books and the novel. Uh, we haven't discussed a lot who Trinity is yet, but uh, expect to find out more information uh, when you play the game. Gotcha. And so somebody named Orion's Angel uh, says that they noticed uh, some concept art that you guys released that shows Lara Croft in her apartment, and he's assuming that is her apartment, and he's wondering, is that just a cutscene at the beginning of the game, or can you add any context to that piece of concept art? We're not going to add a lot of context to that, but that is Lara's apartment, and that is Jonah with Lara. And uh, it, you know, if you notice, she's not she's not in the mansion. She's she's in in, in a flat in London, and uh, it's it's just interesting to see her in context to um, uh, a space that's her own. And you notice there's a lot of books and uh, materials around. Uh, she she sort of lives in. If you think about her apartment, it's 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 a world that is is a little little bit of disarray, but it's because she's interested in so many things. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a that's a quiet little moment right there between Jonah and Lara in her apartment. Gotcha. So she doesn't own the mansion at this point? Well, we're not going into details right now on the mansion, but just know that at this point in the narrative, we're, um, Lara is living in London in a flat, and uh, there is a story to be told about her backstory. All right, interesting. So Deacon says that the experience of Tomb Raider 2013 made him feel a connection to Lara as if she were a real person. What steps are you going to take in regards to developing Lara as more of a character in Rise of the Tomb Raider? Well, one, we're really happy to, to get feedback like that. That's something the team worked very hard to make sure Lara felt like a believable person, someone that um, you can get to know and, and appreciate and, and help uh, grow as she was going through that adventure. Uh, and we're going to be continuing that, um, that theme as we go into Rise, uh, it, it's important that Lara is uh, going on a journey, and this journey is going to have um, trials, and survival is obviously key to our themes. 
Um, and what survival brings is um, tension and drama and danger and an opportunity for Laura to overcome challenges. Um, the difference this time is she's going out and seeking these truths, seeking an adventure, and, uh, and there is a change in her character, but ultimately we want to make sure she, she stays as grounded as she was in Tomb Raider 2013. And kind of on a similar note, Adder Black is wanting to know if the game will kind of retain the same brutal and dark tone of the previous entry, or if things will be a little bit lighter this time around. I think we look at each chapter uh, for our franchise uniquely, but we did set a tone, um, something with, with our beautifully hostile environments, that they're a character in our game, and, and we believe that you, you in order to sell survival, we have to have a darker um, component, or at least a threatening component to the environment. So expect to see some of that threat, but now that we're in Siberia, it's slightly different. The aesthetic is slightly different. Um, snow provides a different color palette, uh, but uh, we aren't just sticking to one look. There is going to be other types of environments and um, different types of weather and times of day, interior spaces, and they all offer a unique flavor uh, to the game that is reflected not only in the environment changes, but also in Lara's character growth. So um, we really try to make sure we map the color palettes and the, and the look and vibe of the environment to what Lara is doing as she's going through this journey. So people were also wondering if this game is also going to have kind of the crazy, violent death animations of the last game. Is that kind of a hallmark of the Tomb Raider franchise now? We, we always look at um, feedback uh, for players' actions and reactions to things as an important part of our component. Um, when it comes to Lara in situations where there is life or death uh, on the line, we want to make sure that the player understands that that consequence is real. And once again, that fits into our overall tone. But um, expect to see um, feedback like that in, in this game as well. And we're always trying to calibrate it for the situation um, we do it uh, we do death sequences based on the the content and what the content needs to be so yes the answer is yes and uh, uh, we we will continue to make sure we're doing the best thing we can to make sure that experience feels as visceral and real as we possibly can make sure. it is the goal to shock players i mean some of these in the reboot i mean they almost felt like a mortal Kombat fatality or something like that they were just so uh, upsetting to viewers and players at the same time is that goal to shock players with what they're seeing so that they then care for laura more we i look at it as a franchise fulfillment i mean if you think of tomb raider the first one i remember the first time that i jumped on spikes and how violent that was or if she took she dove off of a large uh platform and and, and took a header onto the concrete uh, or onto the the stone floor so it's something, um, those kind of uh, deaths have been a part of the franchise since the beginning. So I think what we are seeing now is just a fidelity increase on something that's been a staple for Tomb Raider. Anwar is wondering if this game is going to include more supernatural elements than the reboot or around that same level of supernatural elements. Supernatural components are definitely a part of the equation for Tomb Raider and, and um, there is going to be supernatural ingredients in this one for sure. Uh, we're not going into a lot of detail on what those things are, but the, the idea of uh, creating a world and a part of the world that is locked off from uh, human, most, you know, his, historical knowledge, like where discovering a place that hasn't been seen in thousands of years instantly sort of conjures up images of supernatural or something other than what we can explain with, with modern science. So um, that's what's exciting about the Tomb Raider franchise is you get to make these worlds that look at the, the world that we live in and, and take a nod to things that we know and, and then introduce myths and, in, and ingredients that exist throughout all of cultures that that somehow goes beyond what can be explained. So we're very excited about that is continuing the tradition of supernatural elements within Tomb Raider. Sure, sure. So this is a dumb basic question that I have, adding on to this person's uh, Thumacroft's question. But Thumacroft asks, does it really pretend that the classic series never existed? And I guess my question there is just, where does this fit in the timeline? Like, I understand the last one was a bit of a reboot, but... In the reboot, did you negate all previous entries in Tomb Raider then? Or is this still between uh, the events of the reboot and Tomb Raider 1? 
part of the the reboot concept is a reimagining of uh, the world and franchise and and the, the character of Lara Croft. So the first adventure we had on, in 2013 was the beginning of a, of a new era for for Tomb Raider. Um, but the core tenets of who Lara is and who she will become, and the fact that she's on a journey to become the Tomb Raider, is uh, very important to us. So expect an evolution of her character as she experiences more um, and especially through Rise you're going to see her evolve um, but uh, know that we are not necessarily feathering the sin directly into the events of the classic games but we're taking on the spirit of Tomb Raider and all its facets uh, through the modern lens that we've uh, that we've crafted for Tomb Raider 2013. You know if you think about this first game that we did, it was the beginning of an origin story, and Rise is a continuation of that story to know that she's not quite yet at that place of being the Tomb Raider, and she is, uh, we're, we're going to see her continue to evolve as we go forward. So Jaffa Croft is very happy to see that Jonah is going to be returning for the century, and he's wondering if you can give any sort of update on the state of Sam in this game? We deal with Sam a lot in the comic books. Um, she she plays a, a central role in that in that story. Um, we haven't talked a lot about any other character besides Jonah from uh, the last game making an appearance in Rise of the Tomb Raider. So at this point, we're excited to bring Jonah back. We think he was a character that was really well liked, and to be able to flesh him out a little bit more and to see the counterpoint between Jonah and Lara in this game, it, it's a, an excellent canvas for us to continue to tell a story of Lara and the people that she cares about. Gotcha. On the cover story trip, you did state, at least, that Sam is not in the best place mentally after the events of the last one. So is that fair to say? Yeah, Sam's gone through a lot. I mean, she was the um, she was in the middle of uh, a ritual that could have easily killed her, and you know, Lara was able to save her life. Spoiler alert for those who haven't played 2013. <laughs> Um, but uh, you know, when she came off the island, there was, she was definitely affected by the events there and, uh, Laura as well, but you know, Sam very directly. So yeah, she's, she's definitely had a hard time of it since returning from Yamatai. Gotcha. So Warren Trouble is wondering if the whole game takes place in a snowy locale. Um, no, uh, we, we've, um, we're really excited to be able to explore a full suite of different climates and um, times of day and weather. Uh, snow is a very important part of us describing the Siberian wastelands, but it is not the only environment we're going to see. Um, we will be telling uh, a story that does take place over a couple different regions. Um, and uh, we did send a screenshot out that showcased one of our desert locations. So you will see different types of weather and locale throughout Rise of the Tomb Raider, uh, even though it primarily exists in Siberia, know that we are not going to just stick to one specific look. Gotcha. So Zabala is wondering, are we going to have a more open world this time around? Also, will the missions themselves and the tombs be more open compared to the reboot? We've described the, the world as, as um, a large open hub location with tombs and spaces that sort of uh, connect to these large hubs. They're meant for exploration. They're meant for resource gathering. They're meant for uh, combat and puzzle solving and hunting. The hubs really are the nexus points by which we navigate and, and negotiate our way through the story. Um, so I wouldn't call it an open world. It's definitely not an open world, but it does offer up a lot of player choice. Um, one of the most exciting things about our hub locations is we're able to use them as not only um, the nexus for our main through line story, but they are also a great canvas for us to do hunting. And now our hunting skill tree is is very much tied to the, the animals that you hunt can go directly into your upgrades. Um, also, we have all, all of our challenge tombs come off of, off of hub spaces, and we are investing heavily in challenge tombs and making sure that they are robust, you know, they, have, they are large, they tell stories, and give you very meaningful rewards. Um, and challenge tombs aren't the only tombs we have in the game. We are ensuring that if you're a Tomb Raider fan, you're going to be extremely happy with the Core Path tombs. 
So our hub spaces are at least three times as large as they were on the last game, and our tomb spaces are quite a bit larger with the nested puzzle philosophy. Well, there we go. Uh, so EMP22 is saying, with crafting playing a larger role than it did in the last Tomb Raider, is there going to be upgrading on the go, or is crafting still limited to campfires like in the previous game? We're going to be doing um, the, the camp. The base camp system is going to be expanded. Uh, we will be uh, doing very similar things in the upgrade tree, as far as being able to, to look at your weapons, upgrade them there, look at your skills, purchase skills. But now that we have resources that come from the world in a more specific way, I, I can hunt unique animals that will give me recipes to craft new um, types uh, of. Of, of upgrades. The other thing we we're going to do is um, allow you to to upgrade different bows. Instead of dismantling one bow and, and putting it into the next, you'll actually be able to make a choice in how which which bow you like. Whether it's a recurve bow with um, a specific kind of attribute versus a compound bow, and you'll be able to choose on the fly those those bows that you want. Um, in addition to the to the base camp system, we also are doing some crafting on the fly where you'll be able to craft ammunition, um, uh, healing supplies, and things like that. So we are upgrading the, the way we look at base camp and, and bringing that into the field as well. Gotcha. And Jaffa Croft is wondering if there's any combat implications for the dual axes? Yeah, so dual axe was introduced in, uh, as, as a traversal mechanic, and, and it's actually a very... Um, realistic way by, by which people do climb ice. So um, there was a practicality that we we thought of when we introduced the second axe. We haven't discussed in detail really how axes go uh, will be used beyond uh, the the traversal. We did showcase uh, some upgrades to the axe when, when it came to the, the axe uh, on a wire and being able to use that as a grapple uh, tool. So that's ex extremely exciting to be able to think about Hacks is, uh, is also another having further legs in the upgrade path. But yeah, beyond that, we're not going into details. Gotcha. So a lot of people were asking this, uh, including this guy, Tomb Raider 2015. Uh, basically, a lot of people just want to know that Lara using two pistols at the end of the first game was not just a hollow tease of things to come. Yeah, um, we haven't uh, talked a lot about additional weapon ramps that we we're going to be doing in Tomb Raider, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Uh, so the promise uh, or the moment that we had at the end of uh, Tomb Raider 2013 was a great classic nod seeing Lara Croft with two pistols, um, but we haven't made any commitments going forward. Gotcha. So Chasing the Dark is wondering if you can just explain the approach to swimming in Rise of the Tomb Raider, because it's such a big part of the Tomb Raider franchise. A lot of fans are excited that it's actually coming back. Yeah, we're excited to bring swimming back into Rise of the Tomb Raider. It's uh, something that we all feel is is a important component to um, the Tomb Raider franchise, um, and the way we showcased it right now is is a uh, is a means to traverse areas that we couldn't have traversed through before. So there will be underwater swimming. There will be surface swimming. Um, there there are more components to swimming. But at this point, because we haven't gone into details about that, just know that swimming will play a larger role in how we navigate our environment, and we're excited to add that into her, add that back into her um, traversal arsenal. Yeah, definitely. So Cheeky Chi uh, has a long question, but I like it. Uh, he says the experience of the first game was wonderful. I liked the encounters when discovering a new area, but upon returning, they were always empty. Whilst I don't think it'd be fun to fight the same enemies again and again when returning to that map, I do feel like it'd be better if there were some small pockets of enemies to deal with. And just, he was wondering just if you thought that was an issue with the reboot and if you're maybe changing the approach for Rise of the Tomb Raider. Yeah, we're, in, we're incentivizing um, players going through our hubs once, twice, multiple times, getting rewards, um, encountering new um, threats, uh, encountering new uh, animals to hunt. Um, we want to make sure every time you go through one of our hub spaces that there is something to do. Uh, so there is a tremendous amount of effort going into extending the ecosystem and the living world uh, of, of our hub spaces. Um, there, there is uh, a number of things we've added that uh, will, will give the player who is looking for that extended play something to do that is... Uh, that, that will be not only rewarding, but also will continue to tell the story uh, and, and deepen the story that of Lara's journey. 
Um, so I'm sorry if that sounds a little vague. No, I think that's a good answer. Going... Okay. I think you got it. Uh, so a surprising number of people asked this. I never even considered this, uh, but a lot of people are asking, including Ellie Baker here, whether or not Lara will face female enemies for Rise of the Tomb Raider compared to the all-male encampment that was on Yamatai. Yes, that's a great question. Um, we have, uh, we, we've looked at our cast of characters. Um, the big investment that we've decided to, to work on is fleshing out our animal ecosystem. Um, as you saw, we, we put a lot of time into to bring a new archetype of the bear uh, into, uh, into Rise of the Tomb Raider. But just know, b besides animals, that there is going to be a full suite of interesting characters that Lara is going to meet and interact with. And, uh, and we believe that the, the goal always is to make sure that we have an ecosystem ar around Lara that, that is believable. Um, and that's about all I can say at this point. Huh. At the very least, you did confirm that the bear was a female, right? <laughs> the bear is a female. Okay, there uh, we go, some. everybody. Um, we 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 have we we've had internal uh, names as well as external names. I know Mishka came up, or me, um, I'm sorry, Miso from the fans and Mishka. So um, the fan the fans always win when it comes to naming our our animals like Fifi the crab. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So Darth Frittata is wondering how the Xbox 360 version of Rise of the Tomb Raider is going to compare to the Xbox One version. Yeah, so Crystal Dynamics is focusing 100% on Rise of the Tomb Raider for Xbox One, but we have Nix's, uh, a longtime partner uh, of Crystal, working on the, the 360 version, and um, those guys are wizards, and they're going to do their best to, to deliver the, the best 360 game uh, off of what we're able to create from Rise of the Tomb Raider. It won't be a different game, but it, it will be modified to make sure it, it you gets the most out of uh, the, the 360. And for us, of course, we are we are not limited at all. Um, we are pushing the boundaries when it comes to what the Xbox One can do. And we're excited that we have such a talented group in Nixes to, uh, to bring the best 360 version to the market. Gotcha. So ROTTR is wondering if the tress effects, the hair effects, have been improved at all for Rise of the Tomb Raider. A lot of people really care about Lara's hair, it turns out. So hair has always been important to Tomb Raider and the franchise. Uh, obviously, we spent a lot of time on Tomb Raider 2013, um, starting with the PC version, bringing some of the most advanced hair to the marketplace. Um, we continue that tra tradition on Definitive Edition. And uh, now with the Xbox One uh, and, and Rise of the Tomb Raider, we're bringing what we believe is the best hair in the industry, you know, something that's really industry leading. And we can't wait to show you guys, you know, the kind of improvements that we've made to it. She's not going to be wearing a stocking cap the entire time? No, nope, the stocking cap is uh, for contacts only. But I know a lot of fans are, are happy that she's wearing a jacket in the cold weather. So we wanted to make sure that she was dressed appropriately. Even though the demo that we saw starts with her shivering right out of the gate. So it's not warm enough of a jacket. Well, you know, when you're in you know sub zero temperatures, you're going to be shivering no matter what how many layers you put on. So uh, the idea always is to you know when, with with this adventure, because Lara is not reacting to uh, a survival experience, she's proactively going out off into this terrain. She's coming prepared. But you know when nature has her way, she she will she'll do a number on any any human being and that's where the survival themes come in so yes even though she came in prepared no one can be prepared for what um this hostile siberian landscape has to offer sure sure i can't imagine how cold she's going to be when she gets out of the water after those swimming sections that has to be miserable <laughs> yeah i think uh it's heart stopping uh how cold it must be to come out of waters that cold and you know we've seen um we we, we try to do as much research as we possibly can on um, you know how a human being reacts to these situations, we often look at real-world adventurers and survivors, and how they will uh, find a way to persevere and, and survive some of these hostile situations. And we try to bring all of those elements into the character of Lara Croft. Um, so no matter what, she is a special person. She does persevere, but she is affected by the the, the environment around her, and uh, that's really what makes her human. And during these mocap sessions, do you just crank up the AC just a little bit extra just to really bring it to life? I, I got to say, we are one of the luckiest uh, companies to work with a talent like Camilla. She she brings not only commitment, but um, an authenticity to the character, a voice to the character that, um, you know, we just saw sort of, uh, we saw Lara Croft 
come to life with, with, with her. And she, she always brings the top quality immersion and, um, reaction. Um, I've just never worked with a more talented, uh, uh, actress, uh, than Camilla. She's, she's amazing. Definitely. And speaking of actresses, do you guys have any comments on the news of the Tomb Raider movie, the new, uh, reboot kind of getting off the ground? Uh, yeah, we we're very excited that um, that there is uh, a movie in in the works. Really, at this point, there's not much else we can say about it. We're we're excited it's happening, and all we can do is make the best Rise of the Tomb Raider game we can right now. So, in conclusion, now uh, a guy named Overlord Actual wants to know if there's a time frame in mind for when he can actually see some gameplay from this game. Game Informer was a fantastic opportunity for us to get a first glimpse to the the new world, the character, the story um, of Lara in her second journey now uh, on on her um, adventure to become the Tomb Raider. Um, we would, we're excited to show you guys more in the future and expect to hear some updates very soon. Okay, there's a lot to show off still. Yeah. All right. Is there anything else you want to say, Brian? I just want to thank um, the team uh, that just just know if you're a fan of, of Tomb Raider, you've got um, in this team a, a, a talented group of people that come to work every day trying to make the best experience we possibly can. And we fight for quality. We fight for um, uh, fun. We want to make sure that this is the best Tomb Raider game you're ever going to play. And, and uh, we can't wait for you guys to get your hands on it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian Horton, for calling in. And thank you to everybody who submitted a ton of questions. I hope you guys all learned something. All right, Brian. Really appreciate your time. Hey, thanks a lot. And, um, you know, keep keep coming out with questions. We'll try, try our best to answer the ones that we can. All right. Sounds good, man. All right. Thanks again. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Cheers.